there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. If you haven't noticed, True News is experiencing some growing pains, and I appreciate your patience and understanding as we work through some problems with our online audio files. We're working on the assumption that the ongoing problems in recent weeks are related to a huge surge in new listeners, especially since the Supreme Court decision in late June. Hopefully, we're not under a cyber attack, but we can't rule it out. A lot of the things that we're doing to fix the problem seems to come back, and uh, so we're not quite sure what's happening. On top of all this, we're also running out of office space for new employees. I pre-recorded yesterday's program, and today's program has been pre-recorded, so I could have two days of uninterrupted time to devote to these internal issues. And I'd ask you to pray for us, that the Lord would guide us and direct us and solve these problems. In addition to running out of office space, we're also urgently needing more audio recording space. I've been recording this program for over four years from a renovated walk-in closet that we converted into a recording studio. It's not the best environment to record an international radio program. First of all, it's not soundproof. While on the air, I can hear all the conversations outside my door. If the phone rings in the office or a visitor walks in the door and starts talking loudly, I hear it. You may not hear it, but I hear it, and it distracts me every day when I'm I'm recording this program. And uh, so we've had this situation for over four and a half years. And uh, also when the um, air conditioning unit comes on, the uh, the AC unit uh, uh, blower is right above my, my desk, and uh, we have to filter out that sound also. So it's not been the best environment for us to work in. In addition to True News, we also need a professional studio for the new content that We're going to be producing for the uh, global digital media platform that we will unveil in October, plus the international AM radio stations that we operate on shortwave frequencies and the new 24-hour Christian radio station that we're launching here in Vero Beach, Florida in early September. There's a lot going on in this ministry right now, and it's exciting, and the Lord is pouring on the blessings on this ministry and the growth. And uh, all I can say is that, you know, he is blowing on our sails and we are moving. And right now, all of our time and energy is devoted to keeping up with what the Lord is doing. Now, by faith, I ordered an 8 by 12 foot insulated prefabricated sound isolation recording studio. It's the same model used in Nashville by recording labels for music, and by some television networks, and by some professional sports leagues. It comes in panels, and it can be assembled or disassembled in less than about three or four hours. The cost of the model that we ordered is $18,500. And again, this is a prefab modular studio that we build inside our building. It has the sound insulation foam. It has its own ventilation system. It pulls the air in from the office and circulates it through the studio and back out into the office. Perfectly insulated. Once you walk inside and shut the door, you can't hear anything outside and nobody can hear you. I could go inside and scream if I wanted to. Nobody would hear me. This is the ideal studio 
that we urgently need. And so I went ahead and placed the order, and it will be here on or before August 3rd. I ordered it by faith. I'm believing that God will supply the finances to pay for it. Quite frankly, we need two of them. I'll just be honest with you. We need two. But we have one ordered, and it will be here in the next two weeks. So if you desire to be a contributor to this project, to building us a professional recording studio, then I encourage you to go to truenews.com, T-R-U-N-E-W-S, truenews.com, and click support at the top of the page and then click donate. PayPal users should enter the address support at truenews.com. Checks and money orders should be mailed to Post Office Box 690069, Vero Beach, Florida, 32969. Now, joining me today for the rest of the program is a man whom the Holy Spirit is connecting with me in this ministry and a number of True News listeners. He started listening to True News in September 2014, and I think he's become addicted, and the Holy Spirit has been doing some things in his life and life of his family members ever since and radically changing the direction of his life. The Lord is also connecting him to some other True News guests and True News supporters and some of my longtime friends. It's just the work of the Holy Spirit. And so I asked him to come on the program. He was here last week, and we had a short visit, and I was so inundated with work that I didn't have a lot of time to spend with him to fully understand the connection that God is putting together between him and me in this ministry. And I asked him to come back to Vero Beach uh, in a week or two and spend some time with me privately that we could talk. John Andrews Phillips is a uh, businessman. He's also a preacher of the gospel, and it's an honor to have him on the program now. John, welcome to True News. Thank you, Rick. And I will say it's a sober privilege to be on with you, and I say that just because of the brevity of the times that we're in. It's an honor, but it's a sober and tough honor, if that makes any sense. Yes, sir. Yes, it does. I think about the the sobriety of this assignment every day that I walk in here, and I treat it as though this may be the last day I'm on the radio. I never know. We don't know. First of all, we don't know how long each of us is going to be alive and how how long we can continue the work that we're doing for the Lord. And we also don't know how long the um, world situation is going to permit us to uh, speak freely as we have been speaking. Uh, It's becoming more perilous all the time. So, uh, John, let's uh, first of all, let's give our audience just a background of your your you know, your life and your ministry and how God has used you and your family uh, and uh, what you've been doing for a while and then how this transitioned into listening to True News. Sure. Um, the Southern accent is from North Carolina. You would never believe that I was born in New Jersey, but I moved to North Carolina when I was seven and was picked on so terribly by the kids in school in the rural South in the 70s that I quickly learned how to speak Southern ease. So anyway, I grew up uh, with art and music. I'm a guitar player and singer and songwriter. I moved to Nashville. And actually, you and I have some background with Jim Baker, and it's funny because you got the call to go last minute to do the shows with Jim in Branson, and I happened to be in Panama at the time with Dr. Daniel Davis and Andrew Foote, and you called Andrew or vice versa and asked if you if they could fill in some shows and i actually did i think it was may 19th was my birthday and may 20th that i was the first time guest on your show while you were with jim baker but i kind of started in ministry in the late 80s at, at ptl and was involved in some of the camp meeting show and and some of the music there and jim was a and that whole facility a part of my life and then in uh, nine uh, 89 signed a record deal in nashville tennessee with a now bought out record company called Benson. They had Carmen and Sandy Patty and for him and and little old me. Met my beautiful wife uh to be and we were married in nineteen ninety. Um last week was our twenty fifth wedding anniversary, our silver wedding anniversary. And um 
she's also a singer songwriter and we began traveling all over the country and, and we've been all over this country multiple times and been done work in 12 other countries and as musicianaries as we call it ourselves and uh, preaching singing teaching sharing serving in, in all different capacities and then our life took a wild change in uh, 1999 and, and this is also very interesting you talked about in the introduction how our, we're finding out more and more some of the parallels in, in our calling um, you and I you know of course I've been hearing you many times since I started listening last September share your experience at TBN in April of 1998 when the Lord spoke to you in the chapel well, simultaneously, that same exact month of that same exact year, my niece, a 17-year-old godly young woman by the name of Rachel Joy Scott, some of you automatically will know who that is, and I'll explain to the rest of you in a minute, was getting a prophetic download from the Lord, and she wrote in her journal, and, and just, um, Rachel, on April 20th of 1998, she wrote in her journal that she was keeping to God. God, I have this burden in my heart, and I don't know what it is. I have this burden on my back and pain, and I don't know what it is. She said, I think it's that I'm uh, walking my talk at school, and I've lost friends. But, Jesus, I'm not going to apologize for speaking your name. And then she says these words this way. If I have to sacrifice everything to be with you, and that was interesting that she wrote it that way, to be with you, I will, I will take it. Rick, you already know this because you and I have talked. What our listeners don't know is that one year to the day later, on April 20th, 1999, Rachel Joy Scott would be the first student killed at Columbine High School and was m literally martyred for her faith. Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris shared a media class with Rachel and knew her, knew of her outspoken faith. They taunted her about her faith as, as Eric in particular killed her, shot her three times from a distance, then walked up to her and grabbed her up by the hair of her head. She had a friend sitting outside with her eating lunch by the name of Richard Castaldo. Richard was shot unbelievably nine times and lived. Uh, one of the bullets severed his spinal cord. He's in a wheelchair paralyzed to this day. Um, we have interviewed him and his mother and Richard said that Eric walked up to Rachel, grabbed her up by the hair of her head, and said, Do you still believe in your God now, Rachel? She said, You know I do. Eric Harris put a Tech-9 handgun to Rachel's temple and said, Then go be with him and pull the trigger. Uh, you know, so we, you talk a lot on your program about martyrdom and things that are going on in Syria and Iraq and that we know are coming here to this nation. You just told a story that the establishment news media hasn't told the world. Oh, I know. Well, it's it's being told right now. There's a feature film that began production in Nashville, Tennessee, yesterday uh, that will be released next April twentieth, nineteen or April twentieth, two thousand sixteen. It will be released, and it began filming yesterday with a huge production and budget and crew and telling God's story of Rachel and Rachel's story of God. And, uh, you know, I know we would get to this later, but there's a website uh, called I'm not ashamed movie.com. And there's no apostrophe in I'm, it's just I am. So I'm not ashamed movie.com. And you can learn about <laughs> the truth about what, again, Rachel's story of God and God's story of Rachel. How, how, uh, how did, how did the martyrdom of your niece, Rachel's, Scott, how did it uh, impact you? How did it affect your life? Well, you know, and, and, and just so our listeners know, you you and I did not prepare anything no. at the time. You just said you wanted to talk, so I, I this was not pre-planned to say, but I think the Holy Spirit wants me to share this. Um, and I think it goes with every show that you have to put out, Rick, and I know you don't find pleasure in the, in a lot of the content that you have to put out there but you are obeying exodus 33 and you're being the watchman and you're telling the truth 
So I'm going to tell the truth. I'm an ordained minister, as you said, both my wife and I, as you said in the introduction. I speak to God throughout the day, all day. I start my day talking to God. I end my day talking to God. I've been on multiple fasts and uh, a few very long fasts. I won't go into that. I'm not trying to sound self-righteous. The point I'm making is that I have a deep love relationship with my Father, His Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I commune with him throughout the day, every day. You asked how this affected me. Uh, we got the phone call. Rachel was shot, and the, the shooting began shortly after 11 a.m. Rachel was the first person killed. As I said, according to the sheriff's department's timeline, Rachel was killed at 11.20. Um, we got the phone call shortly after that there was a shooting going on from another family member and that they had found Rachel's brother, Craig, my nephew, Craig Scott, but had not found Rachel. This is a school of 2,200 people, and at first, you're, you know, you're shocked, and you're going to a TV and turning on a TV, but you're, you're praying, and, and but you're sure out of 2,200 kids, your niece is not going to be hurt. Later that day at 7 o'clock, we got the final word about 7 o'clock that evening that, indeed, Rachel was among the 12 students and a, and a teacher. There were 13 killed, 12 students and a teacher. You know, our lives fell apart. We were on a plane the next morning at 6.30 in the morning, and here's what I wanted to say that I had not planned to say. Again, with my intimacy with God, for the next three days when we reached the family, I did not speak to God, Rick, for three days. And I was so shaken by what happened that I had never in my life, you know, I've lived a very privileged life as an American Christian, grew up in a halfway decent home and but you know did never went without food or a bed and, and so privileged that suddenly this rocked my whole paradigm and my whole christian worldview and i literally did not speak to god for three days three days into this in the middle of my fear trauma anger confusion i wrote a poem to rachel and just kind of my grieving process. And uh, that poem, I actually tucked in beside Rachel's body in, in her coffin, and it's buried with her. But that poem was cathartic and gave me the ability to begin inching back up to the throne of God and going, okay, God, you know, where are you? Where were you? you got a lot of explaining to do. And, it, of course, and I'm not saying my attitude was right or I'm just simply being truthful with you that this was the effect it had on me. Yeah, you were in a, you were in a state of shock. Complete shock and complete confusion over my current at that time, which is radically different 16 late years later. My Christian worldview at that time and my Christian worldview today are completely different on many levels. In what way? Well, <laughs> I can't remember if we talked about this this past week when we were together, and, and again, Lord, Holy Spirit, guide this conversation, please, Lord. Um, again, we live in a privileged nation, and I've grown up knowing nothing but, but privilege and blessings for the most part. I mean, this thing with our family is a terrible suffering, but prior to that, and I found out after, for one thing, which we may or may not get into, depending on time, are the miracles and the redemption that are the wildest things of God I've ever seen in my life over the last 16 years when we gave these ashes to God. Isaiah 61, 3 says God gives beauty for ashes. I've proven God that that word's true, but I would say this to our listeners. That's only if you'll give God your ashes. If you want to be bitter, if you want to be angry, if you want to be unforgiving towards God or, or people that have hurt you, you won't get beauty for ashes. You'll get more bitterness and more ashes. But if even if you don't understand like I didn't, and after three days I began to give this back over to God and open my heart back up to God, Rick, it's mind-blowing the miracles we've seen in public schools in the last 16 years in a place where you have separation of church and state and they're told you're not allowed to bring God. If we get into that in a minute, we've seen more revival on public gym floors telling Rachel's story through a multimedia presentation we produced than we've seen in church buildings all over America. Now, to go back and answer your question, I've come to believe, you asked how my worldview is, or Christian view is different. You know, I believe back then, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. To me, that's one of the most 
American church misquoted verses in the New Testament, and I'll try to say quickly why I think that. John recorded that, obviously, and the other disciples were there. We take it as American Christians that God wants us to be happy and blessed in cars and material blessings and happy and joy and, you know, no suffering, no bad. If you follow John and the other disciples' lives from the day Jesus spoke that to the day they each died, they lost their families, they lost their jobs, they were beaten, they were imprisoned. Ten of them were martyred, one of them committed suicide, and John died in exile. So you tell me either Jesus Christ lied to them or abundant life means something else. So in short answer, I've come to believe that abundant life means something besides my physical comfort to answer that question. That's one of the biggest ways my Christian worldviews changed since the death of Rachel. I've learned to say pain is good when God's in it. And most American Christians don't want to hear the word or be around <laughs> pain. I've come to understand that you can't fully enter into communion with Jesus Christ unless you're willing to suffer. I agree. It's the only entrance into full communion with him. I agree. You know, Paul said in Philippians 4, verse 12, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry or naked or clothed. There's the abundant life, the learning the secret of being content and that God is still good if I don't have enough food or somewhere, uh, a house. Paul said it. Even Stephen, I think that was Stephen who, we, you know, he was one of the first ones to find out what abundant life is, the first disciple to be martyred in the account of his martyrdom is not him screaming and crying and begging for his life or rebuking the devil or I rebuke you, spirit of death, or, you know, he's sitting there so full of the Holy Spirit that I can see a smile on his face standing up. He sees heaven open and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, and instead of crying or screaming or begging for his life, he's, oh, God, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. I see you. I'm coming home. Stephen had learned the secret of being content and that abundant life was something in the spirit and not in the flesh. I know every time I tell the Lord in prayer that I want to be more like him. I want more of him in my life. I want to know him more. I want to know him deeper. I know as I'm saying those words, I'm asking for suffering. I know that's what's going to happen because it's the only way that we can truly know him and have more of him, we will have to follow him down that path that leads to suffering. So it's not always physical suffering. There are different types of suffering, but the bottom line is if we're going to be closer to him, he's going to bring suffering into our lives in order to squeeze out the carnality in the flesh of our lives and to make us more like him. Do you have any idea, does anybody in your family know the two teens the two boys, Eric Harris and Dylan, uh, is a Dylan, Dylan Klebold. Dylan Klebold, yes. D Dylan, yes, Dylan Klebold. What motivated them? Were they into a satanic group? Some people have speculated that they had been recruited into some type of MK Ultra mind control experiment. I've heard so many different theories. What motivated these two teenage boys to have so mm -hmm. much hate? And violence well, in their hearts. This is obviously my opinion. Of course, anything I share today is my opinion, but particularly with Columbine, it's obviously an educated opinion because my family member was murdered there, and I've been to the school many times and the place where she was murdered. I met with Kate Batten, who was the lead investigator for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department that did the two-year investigation. I'm one of only two family members that saw the crime scene photos uh, which were horrible to see, of Rachel and others. What I've learned, I was privy, which now it's public information, but at the time, family members, we were privy to almost 900 pages of writings, journal entries, homework assignments with scribbles on them from Dylan and Eric. So, you know, obviously I've studied this and looked into this. One of the things I can tell you, and parents, listen up. Even if you're a single parent, listen up. Dads, listen up. Eric, the one who was responsible for killing Rachel, and this is interesting, Rick, both boys, and a lot of people wouldn't know this, came from homes, upper-class 
homes, white collar parents. Both parents were the biological parents. They were not broken, divorced homes. Eric Harris, we'll start with him. Dad was career Air Force. And Eric, in his own words, in his own writings, they had moved and moved and moved and moved to this state and lived there. And then just when he'd get a few friends, they'd move again because of his dad's Air Force career. And he felt like he could never make any friends or fit in. We know for a fact that, as I said, both parents in both homes, white-collar, upper-class neighborhoods working outside the home. Dylan Klebold drove a BMW to school that day that his parents had provided for him. We know that Eric Harris, and now everybody has cell phones. Back in 1999, there weren't cell phones, at least not as we have them now. Eric Harris had his own personal phone line, landline in his bedroom. He had a refrigerator in his bedroom so that he didn't have to go down to the kitchen. He built 98 pipe bombs in his dad's garage with his dad's tools, with his dad's money, without his dad knowing it. The neighbor knew it because Eric and Dylan would come home in the afternoon while their parents were still at school and were detonating and testing these pipe bombs in the backyard. Rick, the neighbor, called the police. The police came and filed a complaint report, stuck it away in a file, and 11 months later, Columbine happened, and the police never did anything about it. Uh, so in short, to me, and I will say this, from what I've studied and learned of Dylan and Eric, they were not part or outspoken about Satanism. Now, something you talk about on your program almost every day that's very alive and well today is anti-Semitism and that Nazi spirit. And we're even talking about America being in, you know, you said somebody in Russia compared America to the new Germany or the new Nazi Germany. Eric in particular worshipped Adolf Hitler. Yeah, some of you may or may not know that the date that I've mentioned now, April 20th, the day they committed this, this heinous act, is Hitler's birthday. They picked Hitler's birthday to honor Hitler. They planned this for over a year, journaled, wrote, saved up money, stole money to buy weapons and ammo and plan and build pipe bombs and test things. Eric Harris's last English paper assignment, he wrote on Nazism and Hitler. I have a copy of that homework assignment. It praises Hitler. It praises Nazism. So you have two boys, Rick, one more thing there. They watched a movie called Natural Born Killers over and over and over and over. And I hope nobody goes out and watches that. Please don't. But it's a horrible film about a mass murderer. And they idolized that film. There was a video game that they played repeatedly called Doom. Uh, we know for a fact that Eric somehow reprogrammed the video game. He was that tech savvy that he reprogrammed the video game Doom to have the floor plan of Columbine and practice what they were going to do on April 20th. And in some of the videos left behind that I also have copies of, he says, man, on April 20th, it's just going to be like Doom. It's going to be just like Doom when the bombs go off, man. So there were two boys that were unparented. And Rick, and you, again, you parents listening, please hear this. And we think we're a good parent because we've provided our kids with food or tennis shoes or a BMW or a bedroom or their own refrigerator, please, your kids would be better off with you living under a bridge homeless and you spiritually and emotionally nurturing them and spending time with them. If all you've succeeded in doing is giving your kid things that you've not spiritually or emotionally nurtured them, disciplined them, trained them, you're not a good parent. I'm not a good parent. And these were two boys with two biological parents who were unparented and gave over to the dark side and, and obviously demon-possessed and taken over. And that hate was fueled by Eric in particular moving to Columbine area, Littleton area, and having moved so much. And he talked about never fitting in and all his feeling picked on and looked over. And so they kind of joined the fringe group, the trench coat mafia, they were called at Columbine, and said that darkness and their parents uh, I could go on and on I should stop and let you speak with no no I'm, I'm listening uh, intently to this story because it's something I've never heard well, let me years. interject this because this is fascinating and again parents please listen please please hear what I'm about to say this is horrible and very enlightening my sister-in-law Beth Rachel's mom and my wife are sisters. Uh, Rachel's my niece by marriage. My wife and Rachel's mom have both met 
with Sue Klebold, Dylan Klebold's mother. And this is kind of private information, but now it's 16 years later, so I won't divulge too much. But I, and I think Sue's now written a book, and I think this is public information now. Sue told my wife and my sister in law, this is Dylan Klebold's mother, the weekend, Rick, before the 20th, and that fell on a Tuesday, so that would have been the 17th and 18th. This is how far Dylan and Eric played the game, and they were both seniors, and they wrote this and said this in their journals, and I have copies of all this. They said, we've got to really, the closer they got to April 20th, again, they planned it for over a year and picked that day. The closer they got, the more they said, man, we cannot let anything slip. We cannot mess this up now. we got to play the game. we got to act like everything's normal. So Dylan went so far to do that and play the game that he picked the college to go to. He went that weekend before, two days before the shooting, his parents took him to another state, and I don't want to say what college that is, but took him to this college to go pick out his dorm room, Rick, and get his books and get registered for college. His mother told my wife and my sister-in-law, said the only thing we noticed different about Dylan that weekend is that he wore sunglasses the entire time in the middle of the day, in the middle of the night, everywhere. He never took these sunglasses off. And she said, at one point, I took my son, oh, this is horrible, took my son's face in my hands and raised up his sunglasses and said, we're so proud of you. And he would not speak back to me and look back down and pulled the sunglasses back down over his eyes because he knew what he was going to do two, two days later. But was that taken over as he had written and recorded in videos that they had to really play the game? So I'm telling you, parents, go in your children's room. You, you know, don't be your child's friend. You're your child's covering. You're their keeper. You have a charge over them. You have a right to go in their room, look in their stuff. Again, Eric Harris built 98 pipe bombs in his dad's garage without his dad knowing it. When the police went into his bedroom after the shooting, there was a sawed off shotgun barrel laying on his dresser and other things remnants of what they did parenting again i will say it and i'll stop throw it back to you rick but i say that we'd be better off as parents living under a bridge or in a homeless shelter and spending daily time nurturing our children talking to our children listening to our children especially if your kids are in public school man you better be processing with them every day when they get home from school and i know you're tired and you're working and you've got to pay the bills but you can't afford you know you don't want to get the phone call our family got and it, just as much you don't want to be dylan klebold and eric harris's parents my wife said sue klebold was a lovely intelligent woman she works at a university in colorado but she didn't know her own son because she was working all the time and thought she'd been a good parent because she was providing material things for him. Raising your children is the most important thing you're going to do. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's more important than your school. career or anything else. It's raising your children. You're responsible it's, it's your, for their souls. It's exactly right. And they are your legacy, not your bank account. You know, we've handed over, and I know you're big on this, Rick, because I listen to you all the time. You know, it's not the public school's job to educate your children. It's not the Sunday school at the church building's job to spiritually nurture your children, mom and dad, that is your charge. You were to educate your children. I mean, I wouldn't send my kids to public school, but I know a lot of you have to, but you better be processing with them every day. You better be proactive. You and I, let me throw myself in. I better be proactively educating my kids daily, spending time with them, looking in their eyes, listening to them, and also spending time in the Word, spending time in prayer, uh, you know, I'm going to stand before God. Well, I thought the Sunday school was doing that. John, let's bring this conversation up to present day. We now are in a culture that is embracing what the Bible calls an abomination. And so people our age and older, we've got some moral foundation to our lives because we were born and raised in a time when society knew right from wrong. But now we have children being brought up into the world, and right is what was wrong, and wrong is what is right. And they have no concept of morality. If you're a young parent in the United States of America right now, and this nation has just flipped 
out and just gone over to the dark side, what do you do? you got to be vigilant, and it takes daily maintenance. One of the things, Rick, that my wife and I do with our kids every day, we homeschooled our children for years because we traveled full-time with this story in public schools with, with Rachel. We were traveling 250 days a year doing middle school and high school assembly programs. And uh, so we had a nanny and a tutor on the road. Uh, but for the last five years, we've been taking care of elderly parents in a home in northern Indiana and put our kids in public schools. But I can say this, and I'm not saying this because it sounds good. This is my wife and I's priority. We have meet times together every evening, and our kids are not allowed to go eat in their room or go watch TV and eat in the living room. We have dinner time around the table every evening. And we pray before the meal together, and we hold hands. Then there's homework, and or if it's summertime, they have chores, or they can go play or whatever. Every evening, this is our rule. This is what we do. It's our lifestyle. We all climb into our bed, and we process the day. And I let every one of my kids go and turn and share what they're mad about, sad about, what happened at school, what scared you, what made you happy. And then we all pray together, and they all pray. And we pray from the youngest to the oldest, and each one of them prays. We have lists of people that we pray for, often for them, and I'm proud of them because of this nurturing, that they always are talking about classmates or teachers. We need to pray for Miss Jenkins. She's going through a divorce, or you know. And we are diligent. If you're a gardener and you're listening to me, I love to garden. So, you know, and Jesus put things in stories and analogies. If you have a garden and you take time every day to weed it and water it and deal with the bugs and tie up your tomato plants, you're going to have beautiful fruit. If you wait a week to deal with it, you're going to have a lot of hard work to get it back in shape. If you wait a month, you might not get any harvest because the weeds are going to take it over. The bugs are going to take it over. If you do daily maintenance, you're going to have beautiful fruit. You know, this should be the norm. We're talking about this stuff. So to answer your question, it just takes vigilance more than ever. I was in Walgreens the other day with our two younger daughters trying to buy some ice cream for them. Rick, and I know you know this and our listeners know this, standing there at the counter and there's five magazines there, and I won't say the names of them, all five covers. One of them was Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner. The other four had pop stars and stuff and they had the most vulgar sexual headlines on the cover of these things that I wouldn't even say it on the air right now. I was so angry I wanted to just rake my hand across there, and I probably should have, or at least turned them around, but they would have just put them back up. My little daughter is sitting there looking up, reading this filth at Walgreens. It should be at an adult bookstore, and it's at Walgreens when I'm trying to buy some ice cream. We are Babylon. There's no other way to explain it. It's become a filthy, perverted society. It is obsessed with lewdness, and we're going down, down, down the toilet drain. John, we've got about 20 minutes remaining. I want to turn the conversation to what the Lord has been doing in your life and your wife in the last year or so. You got connected to True News about a year ago. I think you told me September of 2014. You and members of your family have been having prophetic dreams about the end times. Tell us about this. Back up to 1985, I grew up in Church of Christ, so a cappella singing, Holy Spirit died with the disciples, Church of Christ. And God bless me, I'm thankful for the spiritual foundation I did get. But uh, in 1985, a prophet in Lincoln to North Carolina came and prophesied over me and said, your life, young man, is going to parallel Joseph's. And I wouldn't know what that would mean so much until 2009, we moved here to northern Indiana, and, and and I started having prophetic dreams. To date, I've had about 16 vivid 3D color prophetic dreams about destruction coming to America and some other nations, too, but predominantly this nation. Three of our five children have had very similar prophetic dreams uh, and even angelic visitations all the way down to our youngest, who was seven at the time she started having these prophetic dreams and visitations, and all of them about destruction and judgment coming on America. And uh, oh, I saw a throw this in there. So as that started in 2009, as I said earlier, I'm, you know, I'm seeking the Lord every day, daily, throughout the day, the Lord, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and remind me that I told you back in 1985 that your life would parallel Joseph's. You've come to the time and season now 
son of the seven of the years of preparation, you know, in the Bible, seven years of preparation for the seven years of famine that are coming. I want you and your wife to prepare spiritually and physically to not only take care of yourself and family, but to be able to help take care of other people when this destruction and storm hits America. That was 2009. The Lord gave us a lot of directive, like he did a lot of other people, that judgment was coming in 2012, I believe. The Lord told me I needed to have certain things and gave me a, a list of things that I needed to have prepared by 2012, and I did. I obeyed the Lord and had those things, and I think prayers and repentance stayed the Lord's hand. Uh, then in, two, in uh, October, shortly after I started listening to True News in, in September, the Lord woke me up one night and said, you're released, and you're done. You've done everything for the last six years I've told you to do, and you're released, and you're now going to get your family in the heart and get out of this country because the dispensation is changing and the door is closing and I'm coming. Hmm. And what year was that? Uh, this past fall, 2014, October, the Lord woke me up one night and said, you're done, and I... I kind of was offended, and we can get into that or not, but the Lord just said, you were you, know. Were you shocked by that word from the Lord? I was, and even offended, because I had been pouring in particular into uh, in this little town we live in. There's 30 congregations, 30 different churches and different denominations, and for five years the Lord had given me a mandate to meet with as many of those pastors that would meet with me and preach First Corinthians 12:12 12, 12, that were many parts but one body, and I heard you, Rick, ask the black gentleman, the preacher that was on yesterday program. Reverend Manning. Manning, Manning report. You know, he's saying how in the world the 2 to 3% of the population control, you know, 98%. I'll tell you how, in my opinion, it's because they are unified and they are proactive and they are militant. In the body of Christ, we have a hand over here crawling along by itself, a foot over there hopping along by itself, a liver over there quivering by itself, and I'm Baptist, I'm Pentecostal, I'm Church of Christ. You know, if we would come together and be the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, and be unified and be proactive and be militant, we wouldn't be seeing Babylon take over America right now. We'd be taking over America. Well, I've said many times that the homosexuals love their sexual perversion more than we love our Savior. I agree. I know that and upsets some a, people, it's but it's a truth. Mindset again. We we love Babylon. We love pleasure. You know, you mentioned that on the program yesterday. That you know, um, Revelation seventeen and eighteen talks about her being delicious in the King James version, and they drank the maddening wine of her adulteries. You know, and and I'm not saying I haven't been guilty at times, but I see so much mixture in the church, and it's this American Christian mindset of pleasure and comfort, and myself. Uh, you know, to me, that's why Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, the three gospel accounts of the second coming, it says many will turn away from the faith. And I believe it's directly because of the, the judgment that's coming on America that they, the pastors never prepared them for, and they are going to suddenly be like I was when my niece was murdered and go, I don't even know who God is. And I'm not going back to that church anymore because that pastor lied to me. I didn't get raptured, like I've heard you say so many times. John, give us an example, one or two examples of the most profound dreams that you or a member of your family have received from the Lord that has really rattled your world and made you change your plans. Sure. I, I already shared one, again, with Daniel Davis and Andrew on May 19th. So if you want to go back, anybody that's listening in the archives and listen to May 19th of this year, you can hear literally a, the most dramatic one in angelic visitation that both my son and I had. So I won't go into that. I think of another one. It was one of the first ones I had, Rick. I was in a motor home uh, with our family and vehicles and dreams represent ministry. And we were on Route 66 out west, and, but we were heading uh, east. And in my dream, the sun was setting in the east and going down behind the mountains. And I thought, now that's strange. In my dream, the sun doesn't sit in the east. It's supposed to be sitting behind me in the west. There was a gas station over to the left, and in my dream, my wife said, pull over there, and the kids and I need to use the restroom. We're going to go in and get some snacks. So I pull over in the parking lot, and I sit in there in the RV pondering this sun setting in the east while they go in. 
The next thing I noticed, Rick, is to my right or to the south, this uh, Spanish wedding party, as you would think of it with the sombreros and the uh, guitars and the trumpets and you know, all this singing, and they're dancing in the bride and the groom, and they're just spinning and singing and dancing, and I thought, oh, that's nice and festive. And then I look over to the to the north, uh, beyond the gas station that my kids had gone, and there was this big meadow and rolling hills, and it was full of Amish. It was a big Amish community. And I could see men out plowing. I could see women hanging laundry on lines. I could see little kids running around playing. I thought, oh, that's picturesque. And then all of a sudden I hear some of the Spanish people in the wedding party start mocking the Amish. So I look back over to the south of this Mexican wedding party, and one guy in particular is really just mocking and laughing, making fun of the Amish and all his cohorts are laughing with him. And then this is what happens next, Rick. I look back to the sun setting in the east and four nuclear bombs go off over the mountains. Four mushroom clouds come up and light up the sky silver in the east. And instantly, of course, I'm in shock. The, the Mexican wedding party comes to a complete standstill. There are some of them that literally drop their instruments to the ground, their guitars and their trumpets. The one that had been mocking the Amish says this out loud. He says, oh my God, it's all over. And then I say, standing there looking at this, I go, it's all over. And I start thinking instantaneously about my kids and my wife and thinking in the dream, I've got to get them in this RV and turn around and start heading west as fast as this RV will come before the fallout from that hits us and kills us and fries us. So I'm, just then, my wife and kids are coming out with some drinks and chips and kind of laughing. I'm screaming at them to come and pointing at the mushroom clouds. And so they run and get in the RV, and right before I pull out, Rick, I look over to see what the Amish are doing, because uh, the Mexicans have run and scrambled and screamed and dropped their things. I look over at the Amish community. The men are still plowing. The women are still hanging up laundry. The kids are still playing as if nothing had happened. And, again, this was in 2009, so this was several years ago when I started having these prophetic dreams, and I woke up and thought, wow, and then God it, what is this? He goes, you've got to prepare to be self-sufficient and off the grid because destruction is coming. And, and these people over here represent Matthew 24. When I was in the days of Noah partying and going and did not know what would happen until the flood came and carried them away. And I've had two other prophetic dreams about attacks on the East Coast. John, do you know, you know why the Amish were not affected? Because those nuclear blasts that you saw represented an EMP attack that took out the technology. And so for the Amish, nothing changed. Yep. That's when we started preparing preppers, as they're called, but getting things ready to be off the system and off the grid. Do I have time to tell you what our youngest daughter yes, did two nights in a row? Two nights in a row, our youngest daughter, this was late last year, too, about the same time we started listening to True News, comes down one morning. Uh, she was nine years old at the time. Dad, I had a crazy dream last night. She said there was 20 Indians standing at our back gate. And I said, East Indians or American Indians? She said, American Indians. And we have a dog, Rick, and a little German shepherd. And her name's Shelby. And she said they had a sack and a knife, and they were trying to get Shelby, and we're going to kill Shelby and eat Shelby. And here's my crazy little daughter. She said, and I said, well, what'd you do? She said, I went outside and got Shelby away from him. Here's a little nine-year-old going out and getting a dog away from 20 wild Indians with a knife and said, you can't have our dog. She said, but you can come in and we'll give you something to eat and you'll be safe, she said, and we won't hurt you. And I was, okay. And then what happened? She said, I brought him in the kitchen and got him something to eat. And then the dream was over. What does that mean, Dad? Uh, Rick instantly, the Holy Spirit, gave me the interpretation. He said, it's, and the Lord had told me uh, maybe a week earlier, he said, Son, even with all the preparation that you've been making and obeying me and listening, you, son, still don't have any idea how horrible and terrible it's going to be when I bring this destruction on this nation. As much as you prepared, you still don't understand how dark and horrible it's going to be. And the Lord spoke to me about my daughter's dream and said, you know, Indians, even more than the Amish, we were just talking about Amish still have some machinery and things. Uh, the Indians were completely 100 percent self-sufficient living off the land. The Lord spoke to me and said, it's going to be so bad soon 
that, that preppers and people that think they're ready and should be able to survive are, are going to be eating dogs and cats and dying and not surviving. It'll be even right? worse, John. They will be cannibals. It's biblical. If you read the Old Testament, when God judged Israel, they were cannibals. They ate their own children. That's how bad it was when God brought judgment on Israel. In fact, they ate their own flesh. They ate their own arms. We cannot comprehend the depth of the famine that will come upon the land. I want to interject this real quick because this goes along even with the Joseph thing. Rick, she comes down the next morning and dreamed the same exact dream over again, every detail, and came down to breakfast the next morning. Dad, I dreamed it again. The Indians were back. They had the knife in the sack. They were trying to kill Shelby. I went out and got the dog away, said, you can come in and get something to eat. We won't hurt you. And the Lord prompted me instantly again about my life paralleling Joseph's. And we all know Joseph had a double dream. And then 13 years later, Pharaoh had a double dream. And, and Joseph says, and it's recorded right there in Genesis, you've had the dream, the two dreams are one and the same, and the Lord has shown this to confirm to you that this is going to happen. And I said, little, I said, girl, the Lord gave you this twice to confirm that this is real and this is going to happen. How has God changed the direction of your life? Well, we thought we would stay here, and as everyone listening has heard, you know, we've experienced martyrdom in our family and we are not afraid to die. We have had discussions. Now, obviously, my children have grown up with their cousin's story and understood martyrdom and have seen God's redemption uh, in that. But we were ready, Rick, to hunker down here and die. And we had, you know, I live in the city. I plowed up half the backyard and planted heirloom seeds and garden. I built a chicken pen and put in 15 chickens. I got wood stoves. I got bars and boards for my windows. I drove a well in my basement and have water in my basement, you know, candles, generators, the whole nine yards, food, food storage. And we were ready to ride out the storm right here and die if we had to. And that's why I said back in October, when the Lord woke me up and said, you're released, I want you to get your family in the ark and get out. I was offended because we'd already resigned ourselves to the fact that we were going to just ride out this horrible thing that was coming and be ready to let God use us however we could and even die if we had to. Nobody can criticize you because, as you said, your family has already experienced persecution and martyrdom. That's correct. So where is the Lord sending you? Well, to Panama. You're going to Panama. Yeah, that was a shocker, too, to us. I had been there. I'd been there back in 2007, but I'd never considered moving there. When he first said that that night in October, I thought maybe he was moving us back down to the hills of Tennessee or the hills of North Carolina where I grew up. But within a few days, the Lord and used your program. You, you know, I'd have to look in the archives, and you may or may not remember, but you went down to see your daughter and son-in-law in Ecuador, and you broadcast from there on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you flew up to Panama nice. and broadcast there on Thursday and Friday, and you had a dinner in both places, invited True News listeners to come yes. out. You, you remember doing that. That was the last week of December in Ecuador and the first week of January of this year in Panama. I was surprised at each event. We had a breakfast on a Saturday in Cuenca, Ecuador, and I was surprised by the turnout of True News listeners in Cuenca. And then we got to Boquete, Panama, and it was standing room only. Yes, sir. Panama owes you a kickback for all the people that moved there that have listened on True News. They need to send you a little percentage of it. Well, maybe they'll name a street for me or something in Boquete. I mean, because we're the best thing going for their economic development program. I agree. I'm, hey, I'm going to work on that. There are hundreds, hundreds of True News listeners in Boquete, Panama right now, and hundreds more on the way. Yeah, I was talking to David Gillian, who's working with Andrew Foote. David's also moved there from this country, and this was maybe a week ago. He told me they're currently working with 74 families right now that are moving there in the next two months. And, of course, everybody's got kind of the September on their radar, and, uh, you know, we've all been hearing that, that we need to be in our places by the 1st of September, wherever that place is, whatever God's telling you, you better get there, and you better get there quick. It's about six weeks from now. 
And uh, he said there's 74 families they're working on helping get over there right now. But, yeah, you used that program, and you had Andrew on or Stephen and Daniel Bays. The Holy Spirit just stuck an arrow in my heart and told me to contact Daniel Bays, and I did, and he responded, and, and the Lord started speaking to my wife and confirming it. And it's been a, a ton more. It's ridiculous how much confirmation and connections and uh, old friends from Focus on the Family we hadn't spoken to in eight years. Daryl Bays, who was head of the Spanish Department at Focus, the Lord told me to contact Daryl. He said, where are you contacting me for? I said, well, crazy, but we're moving to Boquete, Panama. He said, there's silence on the end of the phone. And then he said, Denise and I just got back a week ago from a discovery trip. We're moving there, too. And then he was down there with me that week this past May. And Well, John, I'm, I'm going to tell you, if, as the Lord guides, we are seriously praying about starting a church in Boquete, Panama, because of the mass migration of True News listeners from America to Boquete, Panama. As I said, there are hundreds of families there now. And so we're praying about starting a church in Boquete. And I'm looking at flying down to Panama every weekend to preach in Boquete because there's Holy Ghost fire taking place there right now. There's no other place on the planet right now where so many True News listeners have migrated to. It's number three, too, just in a secular setting. It's AARP. If you go on their website, Panama is the number three most desirable retirement location on the planet, but you don't have to go to AARP to figure that out. Go to the Holy Spirit, and if he's telling you to, you better get after it. But your daughter, I believe, Rick, and then Andrew had shared that, what your daughter had said months back, or you could tell me when it was, that some, she had a dream that some would get out then with shipping containers, some would wait a little longer and get out with suitcases, some would wait a little longer and get out with the shirts on their back, and then some going to wait too long and not get out. That's right. And we're quickly coming up on those days. John, do you want to take the last minute and just speak to the people listening who are wrestling with making a decision? Yes. First of all, you and I did not ask to be put here. God put us here for such a time as this. Tag, we're it. We're living in the most incredible dispensation in the history of the world, in mine and many others' opinion. The Lord is not giving you a spirit of fear so this can be very fearful if you will quiet yourself. Read Psalms 91. Many of you already are, but start praying that over your family, praying it over your children. Read it out loud. Print it out. Read it over yourselves daily. Turn off the world. Turn off the television. Turn off entertainment. Turn off junk food. Turn off Babylon. And get the mixture out of your home. Get quiet. Get with your husband or wife and ask God earnestly together what God wants to to remove from your home, your lifestyle, your habits, so that you can hear God and so that the Holy Spirit's not grieved and can direct you and your family, and He will. And one thing I want to say to people, because I see this one common theme in a lot of emails, people say, I don't have the money to go, and I understand that, but you're making a statement in unbelief. You're saying that God is unable to provide for you, and you have to believe that He will make provision if He's sending you somewhere he will make provision. We're out of time. My guest, John Andrews Philip, and he's a listener of True News, a minister of the gospel, a businessman, and suddenly now he is an international adventurer, the Lord uprooting him from the United States of America and sending him into Central America for a new chapter in his life. John, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, General Wiles. Well, this is amazing how many True News listeners are, are moving to Boquete, Panama. I think the first time I went to Boquete was uh, October 2009. I went there by myself, and, and I went back uh, once per year, and I prayed over that little town. I had no idea what God had planned for it, but now there are hundreds of True News listeners who have moved there and more on the way. Food or tennis shoes or a BMW or a bedroom or their own refrigerator. Please, your kids would be better off with you living under a bridge homeless and you spiritually and emotionally nurturing them and spending time with them. If all you've succeeded in doing is giving your kid things but you've not spiritually or emotionally nurtured them, disciplined them, trained them, you're not a good parent. I'm not a good parent. And these were two boys with two biological parents who were unparented and gave over to the dark side and, and obviously demon-possessed and taken over. And that hate was fueled by Eric in particular moving to Columbine 
area, Middleton area, and having moved so much, and he talked about never fitting in, and I was feeling picked on, looked over, and so they kind of joined the fringe group, the trench coat mafia, they were called it, Columbine, and said that darkness, and their parents said, uh, I could go on and on, I should stop and let you speak with No, me. no, I'm, I'm listening uh, intently to this story, because it's something I've never heard. Well, let me years. interject this, because this is fascinating. And again, parents, please listen. Please, please hear what I'm about to say. This is horrible and very enlightening. My sister-in-law, Beth, Rachel's mom and my wife are sisters. Uh, Rachel's my niece by marriage. My wife and Rachel's... Cannibals. It's biblical. If you read the Old Testament, when God judged Israel, they were cannibals. They ate their own children. That's how bad it was when God brought judgment on Israel. In fact, they ate their own flesh. They ate their own arms. We cannot comprehend the depth of the famine that will come upon the land. I want to interject this real quick because this goes along even with the Joseph thing. Rick, she comes down the next morning and dreamed the same exact dream over again. Every detail. And came down to breakfast the next morning. Dad, I dreamed it again. The Indians were back. They had the knife in the sack. They were trying to kill Shelby. I went out and got the dog away. Said, you can come in and get something to eat. We won't hurt you. And the Lord prompted me instantly again about my life paralleling Joseph's. And we all know Joseph had a double dream. And then 13 years later, Pharaoh had a double dream. And, and Joseph says, and it's recorded right there in Genesis, you've had the dream, the two dreams are one and the same, and the Lord has shown this to confirm to you that this is going to happen. And I said, Lou, I said, girl, the Lord gave you this twice to confirm that this is real and this is going to happen. How has God changed the direction of your life? Well, we thought we would stay here, and as everyone listening has heard, you know, we've experienced martyrdom in our family and we listen up eric the one who was responsible for killing rachel and this is interesting rick both boys and a lot of people wouldn't know this came from homes upper class homes white collar parents both parents were the biological parents they were not broken divorced homes eric harris we'll start with him dad was career air force And Eric, in his own words, in his own writings, they had moved and moved and moved and moved to this state and lived there. And then just when he'd get a few friends, they'd move again because of his dad's Air Force career. And he felt like he could never make any friends or fit in. We know for a fact that, as I said, both parents in both homes, white-collar, upper-class neighborhoods, working outside the home. Dylan Klebold drove a BMW to school that day that his parents had provided for him. We know that Eric Harris, and now everybody has cell phones. Back in 1999, there weren't cell phones, at least not as we have them now. Eric Harris had his own personal phone line, landline in his bedroom. He had a refrigerator in his bedroom so that he didn't have to go down to the kitchen. He built 98 pipe bombs in his dad's garage with his dad's tools, with his dad's money, without his dad knowing it. The neighbor knew it because Eric and Dylan would come home in the afternoon while the parents were still at school and were detonating and testing these pipe bombs in the backyard. Rick, the neighbor, called the police. The police came and filed King James Version, and they drank the maddening wine of her adultery. You know, and and I'm not saying I haven't been guilty at times, but I see so much mixture in the church, and it's this American Christian mindset of pleasure and comfort and myself. Uh, you know, to me, that's why Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, the three gospel accounts of the second coming it says many will turn away from the faith and i believe it's directly because of the the judgment that's coming on america that they the pastors never prepared them for and they are going to suddenly be like i was when my niece was murdered and go i don't even know who god is and i'm not going back to that church anymore because that pastor lied to me i didn't get raptured like i've heard you say so many times john give us an example one or two examples of the most profound dreams that you or a member of your family have received from the Lord that has really rattled your world and made you change your plans? Sure. 
I, I already shared one again with Daniel Davis and Andrew on May 19th. So if you want to go back, anybody that's listening in the archives and listen to May 19th of this year, you can hear literally a, the most dramatic one in angelic visitation that both my son and I had. So I won't go into that. I think of another one. It was one of the first ones I had, Rick. I was in a motor home uh, with our family and vehicles and dreams represent ministry, and we were en route. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. If you haven't noticed, True News is experiencing some growing pains, and I appreciate your patience and understanding as we work through some problems with our online audio files. We're working on the assumption that the ongoing problems in recent weeks are related to a huge surge in new listeners, especially since the Supreme Court decision in late June. Hopefully, we're not under a cyber attack, but we can't rule it out. A lot of the things that we're doing to fix the problem seems to come back. And uh, so we're not quite sure what's happening. On top of all this, we're also running out of office space for new employees. I pre-recorded yesterday's program and today's program has been pre-recorded so I could have two days of uninterrupted time to devote to these internal issues. And I'd ask you to pray for us that the Lord would guide us and direct us and solve these problems. In addition to running out of office space, we're also urgently needing more audio recording space. I've been recording. My attitude was right, or I'm just simply being truthful with you that this was the effect it had on me. You were in a, you were in a state of shock. Complete shock and complete confusion over my current at that time, which is radically different 16 late years later. My Christian worldview at that time and my Christian worldview today are completely different on many levels. In what way? Well, <laughs> I can't remember if we talked about this this past week when we were together. And, and again, Lord, Holy Spirit, guide this conversation, please, Lord. Um, again, we live in a privileged nation, and I've grown up knowing nothing but, but privilege and blessings for the most part. I mean, this thing with our families is a terrible suffering, but prior to that, and I found out after for one thing, which we may or may not get into, depending on time, are the miracles and the redemption that are the wildest things of God I've ever seen in my life over the last 16 years when we gave these ashes to God. Isaiah 61, 3 says, God gives beauty for ashes. I've proven God that that word's true, but I would say this to our listeners. That's only if you'll give God your ashes. If you want to be bitter, if you want to be angry, if you want to be unforgiving towards God or or people that have hurt you, you won't get beauty for ashes. You'll get more bitterness and more ashes. All the way from 20 wild Indians with a knife and said, you can't have our dog. She said, but you can come in and we'll give you something to eat and you'll be safe, she said, and we won't hurt you. And I was, okay. And then what happened? She said, I brought him in the kitchen and got him something to eat. And then the dream was over. What does that mean, Dad? Uh, Rick instantly, the Holy Spirit, gave me the interpretation. He said, and the Lord had told me uh, maybe a week earlier, he said, Son, even with all the preparation that you've been making and obeying me and listening, you, son, still don't have any idea how horrible and terrible it's going to be when I bring this destruction on this nation. As much as you prepared, you still don't understand how dark and horrible it's going to be. And the Lord spoke to me about my daughter's dream and said, you know, Indians, even more than the Amish, we were just talking about Amish still have some machinery and things. Uh, The Indians were completely 100 percent self-sufficient living off the land. The Lord spoke to me and said, it's going to be so bad soon that that preppers and people that think they're ready and should be able to survive are are going to be eating dogs and cats and dying and not surviving. It'll be even worse, John. They will be cannibals. It's biblical. If you read the Old Testament, when God judged Israel, they were cannibals. They ate their own children. That's how bad it was when God brought judgment on Israel. In fact, they ate their own flesh. They ate their own arms. Killed at eleven twenty, 
Um, we got the phone call shortly after that there was a shooting going on from another family member and that they had found Rachel's brother, Craig, my nephew, Craig Scott, but had not found Rachel. This is a school of 2,200 people, and at first, you're, you know, you're shocked, and you're going to a TV and turning on a TV, but you're, you're praying, and, and but you're sure out of 2,200 kids, your niece is not going to be hurt. Later that day at 7 o'clock, we got the final word about 7 o'clock that evening that, indeed, Rachel was among the 12 students and a, and a teacher. There were 13 killed, 12 students and a teacher. You know, our lives fell apart. We were on a plane the next morning at 6.30 in the morning, and you, here's what I wanted to say that I had not planned to say. Again, with my intimacy with God, for the next three days when we reached the family, I did not speak to God, Rick, for three days. And I was so shaken by what happened that I had never in my life, you know, I've lived a very privileged life as an American Christian, grew up in a halfway decent home and but you know did, never went without food or a bed and, and so privileged that suddenly this rocked my whole paradigm and my whole christian worldview and i literally did not speak to god for three days three days into this in the middle of my fear trauma anger confusion i wrote a poem w to school that day that his parents had provided for him we know that eric harris and now everybody has cell phones back in 1999 there weren't cell phones, or at least not as we have them now. Eric Harris had his own personal phone line, landline in his bedroom. He had a refrigerator in his bedroom so that he didn't have to go down to the kitchen. He built 98 pipe bombs in his dad's garage with his dad's tools, with his dad's money, without his dad knowing it. The neighbor knew it because Eric and Dylan would come home in the afternoon while the parents were still at school and were detonating and testing these pipe bombs in the backyard. Rick the neighbor called the police. The police came and filed a complaint report, stuck it away in a file, and 11 months later, Columbine happened, and the police never did anything about it. Uh, so in short, to me, and I will say this, from what I've studied and learned of Dylan and Eric, they were not part or outspoken about Satanism. Now, something you talk about on your program almost every day that's very alive and and well today is anti-Semitism and that Nazi spirit. And we're even talking about America being, in, you know, you said somebody in Russia compared America mm-hmm. to the new Germany or the new Nazi Germany. Eric in particular worshipped Adolf Hitler. Yeah, some of you may or may not know that the date uh, that I've mentioned now, April 20th, the day they committed this, this heinous act, is Hitler's birthday. They picked Hitler's birthday to honor Hitler. What I've learned, I was privy, which now it's public information, but at the time, family members, we were privy to almost 900 pages of writings, journal entries, homework assignments with scribbles on them from Dylan and Eric. So, you know, obviously I've studied this and looked into this. One of the things I can tell you, and parents listen up, even if you're a single parent, listen up, dads listen up, Eric, the one who was responsible for killing Rachel, And this is interesting, Rick. Both boys, and a lot of people wouldn't know this, came from homes, upper-class homes, white-collar parents. Both parents were the biological parents. They were not broken, divorced homes. Eric Harris, we'll start with him. Dad was career Air Force. And Eric, in his own words, in his own writings, they had moved and moved and moved and moved to this state and lived there. And then just when he'd get a few friends, they'd move again because of his dad's Air Force career. And he felt like he could never make any friends or fit in. We know for a fact that, as I said, both parents in both homes, white-collar, upper-class neighborhoods working outside the home, Dylan Klebold drove a BMW to school that day that his parents had provided for him. We know that Eric Harris, and now everybody has cell phones. Back in 1999, there weren't cell phones, at least not as we have them now. Eric Harris had his own personal phone line, landline in his bedroom. April 20th, 2016, it will be released, and it began filming yesterday with a huge production and budget and crew and telling God's story of Rachel and Rachel's story of God. And, uh, you know, I know we would get to this later, but there's a website uh, called I'm not ashamed movie.com and there's no apostrophe and I'm it's just I am so I'm not ashamed movie.com and you can learn about the truth about what 
again, Rachel's story of God and God's story of Rachel. How, how, uh, how did how did the martyrdom of your niece, Rachel Scott, how did it uh, impact you? How did it affect your life? Well, you know, and, I, and, and just so our listeners know, you, you and I did not prepare anything no. at the time. You just said you wanted to talk, so I... I this was not pre-planned to say, but I think the Holy Spirit wants me to share this. Um, and I think it goes with every show that you have to put out, Rick. And I know you don't find pleasure in the, in a lot of the content that you have to put out there, but you are obeying Exodus 33, and you're being the watchman, and you're telling the truth. So I'm going to tell the truth. I'm an ordained minister, as you said, both my wife and I, as you said in the introduction. I speak to God throughout the day, all day. I start my day talking to God. I end my day talking to God. I've been on multiple wedding parties. You would think of it with the sombreros and the uh, guitars and the trumpets and all this singing, and they're dancing, and the bride and the groom, and they're just spinning and singing and dancing, and I thought, oh, that's nice and festive. And then I look over to the to the north, uh, beyond the gas station that my kids had gone on, there was this big meadow and rolling hills, and it was full of Amish. It was a big Amish community. And I could see men out plowing. I could see women hanging laundry on lines. I could see little kids running around playing. I thought, oh, that's picturesque. And then all of a sudden I hear some of the Spanish people in the wedding party start mocking the Amish. So I look back over to the south to this Mexican wedding party, and one guy in particular is really just mocking and laughing, making fun of the Amish and all his cohorts are laughing with him and then this is what happens next rick i look back to the sun setting in the east and four nuclear bombs go off over the mountains four mushroom clouds come up and light up the sky silver in the east and instantly of course i'm in shock the the mexican wedding party comes to a complete standstill there are some of them that literally drop their instruments to the ground their guitars and their trumpets the one that had been mocking the amish says this out loud he says oh my god it's all over and then i say standing there looking at this i go it's all over and i start here for such a time as this tag we're it we're living in the most incredible dispensation in the history of the world in mine and many others opinion the lord is not giving you a spirit of fear so this can be very fearful if you will quiet yourself. Read Psalms 91. Many of you already are, but start praying that over your family, praying it over your children. Read it out loud. Print it out. Read it over yourselves daily. Turn off the world. Turn off the television. Turn off entertainment. Turn off junk food. Turn off Babylon. And get the mixture out of your home. Get quiet. Get with your husband or wife and ask God earnestly together what God wants to remove from your home, your lifestyle, your habits, so that you can hear God and so that the Holy Spirit's not grieved and can direct you and your family, and He will. And one thing I want to say to people, because I see this one common theme in a lot of emails, people say, I don't have the money to go, and I understand that, but you're making a statement in unbelief. You're saying that God is unable to provide for you, and you have to believe that He will make provision if He's sending you somewhere he will make provision. We're out of time. My guest, John Andrews Phillip, and he's a listener of True News, a minister of the gospel, a businessman, and suddenly now he is an international adventurer, the Lord uprooting him from the United States of America and sending him into Central America for a new chapter in his life. John? Kids in school in the rural south in the 70s that I quickly learned how to speak Southern ease. So anyway, I grew up uh, uh, with art and music. I'm a guitar player and singer and songwriter. I moved to Nashville. And actually, you and I have some background with Jim Baker, and it's funny because you got the call to go last minute to do the shows with Jim in Branson, and I happened to be in Panama at the time with Dr. Daniel Davis and Andrew Foote, and you called Andrew or vice versa and asked if you if they could fill in some shows and i actually did i think it was may 19th was my birthday and may 20th that i was a first time guest on your show while you were jim baker but i kind of started in ministry in the late 80s at, at ptl and was involved in some of the camp meeting show and and some of the music there and jim was a 
and that whole facility a part of my life. And then in uh, nine, uh, 89, signed a record deal in Nashville, Tennessee with a now bought out record company called Benson. They had Carmen and Sandy Patty and for him and, and little old me met my beautiful wife, uh, to be, and we were married in 1990. Um, last week was our 25th wedding anniversary, our silver wedding anniversary. And, um, She's also a singer-songwriter, and we began traveling all over the country, and and we've been all over. Her name's Shelby, and she said they had a sack and a knife, and they were trying to get Shelby, and we're going to kill Shelby and eat Shelby. And here's my crazy little daughter. She said, and I said, what would you do? She said, I went outside and got Shelby away from him. Here's a little nine-year-old going out and getting a dog away from 20 wild Indians with a knife and said, you can't have our dog. She said, but you can come in, and we'll give you something to eat. And you'll be safe, she said, and we won't hurt you. And I was, okay. And then what happened? She said, I brought him in the kitchen and got him something to eat. And then the dream was over. What does that mean, Dad? Uh, Rick instantly, the Holy Spirit, gave me the interpretation. He said, it's, and the Lord had told me uh, maybe a week earlier, he said, Son, even with all the preparation that you've been making and obeying me and listening, you, son, still don't have any idea how horrible and terrible it's going to be when I bring this destruction on this nation. As much as you prepared, you still don't understand how dark and horrible it's going to be. And the Lord spoke to me about my daughter's dream and said, you know, Indians, even more than the Amish, we were just talking about Amish still have some machinery and things. Uh, the Indians were completely 100% self-sufficient living off the land. The Lord spoke to me and said, it's going to be so bad soon that, that preppers and people that think they're ready and should be able to survive are, are going to be eating dogs and cats and dying and not surviving. It'll be even worse, John. They will be cannibals. It's biblical. If you'll read the Old Testament... ...family in the heart can get out of this country because the dispensation is changing and the door is closing and I'm coming. Hmm. And what year was that? Uh, This past fall, 2014, October, the Lord woke me up one night and said, you're done, and I I kind of was offended, and uh, we can get into that or not, but the Lord just said, you were you, know. Were you shocked by that word from the Lord? I was, and even offended, because I had been pouring in particular into uh, in this little town we live in. There's 30 congregations, 30 different churches and different denominations, and for five years the Lord had given me a mandate to meet with as many of those pastors that would meet with me and preach 1 Corinthians 12, 12, that were many parts but one body, and I heard you, Rick, ask the black gentleman, the preacher that was on yesterday program. Reverend Manning. Manning, Manning report. You know, saying how in the world the 2 to 3% of the population control, you know, 98%. I'll tell you how, in my opinion, it's because they are unified and they are proactive and they are militant. In the body of Christ, we have a hand over here crawling along by itself, a foot over there hopping along by itself, a liver over there quivering by itself, and I'm Baptist, I'm Pentecostal, I'm Church of Christ. You know, if we would come together and be the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, and be unified,